Tonight, new evacuations as firefighters race to get the upper hand on a historic wildfire exploding in size and now racing through a large part of Northern California. The Park Fire, just one of more than 100 raging across the West. Thousands of firefighters are on the front lines of the flames, a state of emergency declared. At one point, the Park Fire scorching 5,000 acres an hour. It's already charred an area larger than the city of Phoenix. A popular campground is now under evacuation. We're with residents as they return to their homes. Jacqueline Lee reports from the fire zone. The ABC News exclusive stunning new details from the local SWAT team who were standing guard during the attempted assassination of former President Trump. Tonight they say they had no communication with the Secret Service until after the shooting. Aaron Katursky reports. With just 100 days to go, the race for the White House tightens. Details of the new ABC News Ipsos poll. What voters think of Vice President Harris and former President Trump as the Democratic VP hopefuls audition for the role, while pressure mounts on Republican vice presidential candidate J.D. Vance. Fears of a wider war in the Middle East. Israel retaliates in response to the deadly missile strike on civilians in the Israeli-controlled Golan Heights. Matt Rivers reports from Israel and Marcus Moore on the ground in Beirut. Calls for justice across the country. A day of mourning for Sonia Massey, the black woman shot dead in her own kitchen by a deputy. A terrifying attack on the high seas. A pot of killer whales sinks a yacht two miles offshore. The promising new Alzheimer's blood test that could speed up the diagnosis for patients. Simone Biles wows at the Summer Games, dominating on the world stage despite an apparent injury. What lies ahead for the GOAT and Team USA? Maggie Ruley reports from Paris. And America Strong tonight, 100 years and celebrating the twins who brought five generations together to share their special day. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for joining us on this busy Sunday. We begin with those wildfires raging across the West, more than 100 in all, including the explosive park fire in Northern California. That fast moving wildfire is now the largest in the state so far this year, scorching more than 350,000 acres. New evacuations are now underway. Firefighters are working to contain the blaze, but face tough conditions. The flames leaving a trail of ashes, smoke and devastating piles of what once was. Ronnie Stout, accused of setting that fire, now faces arson charges and is due in court tomorrow. Some experts fear this fire could burn for weeks. We have team coverage tonight. ABC's Jacqueline Lee leads us off from the fire zone. Tonight, California's largest wildfire of the year rapidly growing, forcing new evacuations. We're doing the best we can to safely get them back. The park fire destroying dozens of homes and buildings, scorching more than 350,000 acres. Firefighters continuing to hold the line, putting out these spot fires. You can see the flames burning inside that tree trunk, and it is a race against time as temperatures continue to rise later this week. The fire now 12% contained, one of more than 100 wildfires burning in the West. We met rancher John Russell near the city of Chico. When you say, did you think it would ever happen? You better believe it. Officials arrested 42-year-old Ronnie Stout for suspected arson, alleging he pushed this car while it was on fire down an embankment, sparking one of the fastest moving fires in recent memory. Are you angry about it? I'll put it tactfully, truly the real damage and sadness and anger would be come from the people who have lost everything. Russell showing us the charred trails and piles of ash. His barn still standing thanks to a quick thinking firefighter who dug out a fire line. That's what saved this place because you can see it burned right up to it. We finally came to a clearing, an untouched field. His beloved cattle survived. The fire was raging this, this way. way and coming yeah. straight for them. Yes. But roaring above, a reminder of the ongoing battle tonight. Every time one went by, I said, thank you guys, thank you guys. Lindsay, firefighters continuing their ground assault, setting these backfires. You can see the smoke and the ashes swirling, and this fight is far from over. The fire expected to last at least another month. Lindsay. It is now the seventh largest fire in the state's history. Jacqueline, thank you. Let's get right to meteorologist Jeff Smith from our New York station, WABC. And Jeff, I know you're tracking the smoke from these wildfires. 
Lindsay, if you look up in the sky across much of the northern half of the country, you see evidence of these wildfires. We have smoky, hazy skies across much of both the U.S. and Canada. Over 850 fires in Canada, 100 here in the U.S. The most concentrated smoke, though, from that park fire in northern California, spreading smoke into parts of Nevada, Idaho, all the way to Wyoming and Montana. By later on tomorrow afternoon, into parts of the Dakotas and also Nebraska. The other big story, the heat that will be building in the heartland. We're going to have heat index values or feels like numbers well above 100. Kansas City, Tulsa, and St. Louis through much of the upcoming week. Lindsay? Lots of triple digits there. Jeff, thank you. Now to an ABC News exclusive. Stunning new details from the local Pennsylvania SWAT team on duty during the assassination attempt on former President Trump. They are speaking out for the first time and say there was a lack of communication between the officers and the Secret Service on the day of the rally before the gunman opened fire. More now from ABC's senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. Tonight, for the first time since the attempted assassination of former President Trump in Pennsylvania, the Beaver County SWAT team assigned to take up positions at the rally, speaking out, telling ABC News in an exclusive interview they had no communication with the Secret Service until after Thomas Matthew Crooks opened fire. We were supposed to get a face-to-face -face briefing with the Secret Service snipers um, whenever they arrived, and that never happened. So I think that that was probably a pivotal point where I started thinking things were wrong because that never happened, and we had no communication with the Secret Service. You had no communication with the Secret Service at all on that Saturday? No, not until after the shooting, I believe. Yeah. And by then? It was too late. That same SWAT team says they saw the gunman an hour before the shooting. Sniper Greg Nichols says he recognized Crooks as suspicious, taking these photos of him. Nichols says his suspicions grew when he noticed Crooks pull something out of his pocket. It ended up being a rangefinder. At first I was like, ah, it can't be a rangefinder. I thought maybe it was a monocular. Um, I had my binoculars, so I zoomed in and I, I was like, that's a rangefinder. And that sends up a flag in your head. Yeah, absolutely. But today, the Washington Post reports members of Trump's Secret Service detail have complained they were never made aware of that warning. Was this a failure of communication? I, I believe so in, in a lot of respects. In uh, multiple agencies working together is always taxing, no matter what the problem. I know that we could not communicate with Secret Service or Pennsylvania State Police or really in effort the patrol directly. The Secret Service declined to respond directly to the comments from Beaver County authorities, but said in a statement the agency is committed to better understanding what happened to ensure it never happens again. Aaron Katursky joins us tonight. And Aaron, we know that Donald Trump has said that he's going to go back to western Pennsylvania for another rally. Could it be that the same SWAT team is asked to secure that event? Sure could. And in fact, that's part of the reason why they're racing now to understand what happened, what went wrong at the earlier rally. And Lindsay, this team from Beaver County is willing to concede it was a failure and they're now shouldering their share of the blame, Lindsay. A number of lessons learned here. Aaron, thank you so much. And you can see much more of that exclusive interview tomorrow morning on Good Morning America. Now to the race for the White House, tightening 100 days out from Election Day. A new ABC News Ipsos poll shows Vice President Kamala Harris getting a bounce, her favorability rating up eight points in just one week. Several of the contenders vying to become Harris's running mate dominated the airwaves today and the campaign trail. Here's ABC's White House correspondent, Mary Alice Parks. Tonight, both campaigns in high gear with no time to waste. Election Day just 100 days away. Vice President Kamala Harris has only been a presidential candidate for seven days. But her favorability rating has grown by eight points to 43 percent, according to our new ABC News Ipsos poll. Now potential running mates jockeying to join the Harris ticket, blitzing the campaign trail and Sunday shows. I had a great conversation with her and I pledged to her that no matter what the outcome of this process, uh, that I'd be working hard for her and uh, making sure that she wins in November. From billionaire Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker, an heir to the Hyatt hotel chain, to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg out defending Harris. I'm pretty sure voters are well, worried about the age and acuity of President Trump compared to Kamala Harris, who represents uh, being a generation younger. Harris celebrating a groundswell of support, claiming her campaign Payne has raised $200 million in this last week since Biden dropped out and endorsed her. In battleground states, people have been flooding our offices around the country to volunteer. Former President Trump saying he's done with any idea of toning down the rhetoric after that assassination attempt. We have a brand new victim.
And honestly, she's a radical left lunatic. Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz, beloved by unions and also rumored to be a top VP contender for Harris, unfazed, arguing Republicans say every Democrat is too liberal. What a monster. Kids are eating, eating and having full bellies so they can go learn. And women are making their own health care decisions. Look, they're going to label whatever they're going to label. Trump's running mate, Ohio Senator J.D. Vance, today dismissing the scrutiny that he's faced for past comments that he made about not liking Trump. Donald Trump accepts that people can change their mind. Now, Vice President Harris is expected to announce her running mate by August 7th. That's when the Democratic Party is hoping to wrap up their formal nominating process. That process could actually begin as early as this week with a remote virtual roll call of delegates. Lindsay? Things are happening quickly. Mary Alice from the White House, thanks so much. Next tonight, a nation remembers Sonia Massey. Vigils were held in dozens of cities for the 36-year-old mother of two, fatally shot by a sheriff's deputy in her own kitchen in Springfield, Illinois. That officer was fired and charged with first-degree murder. The case continues to spark national outrage and demands for justice. Overseas now to the escalating tensions in the Middle East, the IDF launching a series of strikes inside Lebanon. That's after 12 children were killed by a rock at launch from Lebanon. Diplomats are now desperately trying to keep a full-scale war from erupting between Israel and Hezbollah. Ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas resumed today in Rome. ABC's Matt Rivers reports from Tel Aviv tonight. Tonight, the Middle East on a knife's edge as Israel prepares its response to the deadliest attack on its soil since October 7th. Around 6 p.m. Saturday, at least 30 projectiles were launched from Lebanon. The IDF and the U.S. say one rocket fired by Hezbollah hit a soccer field in this Druze community in the Israeli-controlled Golan Heights. Authorities now investigating this video circulating online showing the moment. We tried to help a kid. I still doesn't know his name. I still don't know his name and I don't know if he's alive or dead. Twelve children killed. Dozens more people injured. Just before that rocket struck right there behind me, alarms went off and the children that were playing on this soccer field scattered. They tried to find safety. Some of them actually ran here towards this bomb shelter, but many of them were not able to make it in time. And you can see the damage that rocket did here to this concrete structure. Tonight, heightened tensions across the region. Israel and Hezbollah trading fire daily since last October. Our Marcus Moore on the ground in Beirut. Well, Hezbollah has denied it was behind the strike on that soccer field. Many people here in Beirut and across the region are bracing for Israel's next move. And they're still concerned that it could spark a wider regional war. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu huddling with his cabinet as he vows Hezbollah will pay a price, quote, it hasn't paid before. Secretary of State Antony Blinken calling for the two to de-escalate. We also don't want to see the conflict escalate. We don't want to see it spread. That has been uh, one of our goals from day one, from, uh, from October 7th on. And Lindsey Blinken also said that is part of the reason they're working so hard to try and secure a ceasefire deal for the fighting in Gaza. Negotiators meeting once again today in Rome, though no progress reported. Lindsay. The White House says Israel and Hamas are closer than they've been before to a ceasefire deal. Matt, our thanks to you. Venezuelans, meanwhile, headed to the polls today for a high-stakes presidential election. The authoritarian regime of Nicolas Maduro is facing one of its toughest challenges in years. Let's bring in ABC's Patrick Rivo. And Patrick, what's the latest? Hi, Lindsay. Yeah, polls have just closed in this critical and highly uncertain election where a united opposition hopes it can finally end the authoritarian rule of Nicolas Maduro. Independent polling before today predicted strong support for Maduro's opponent, Edmundo Gonzalez. He is a stand-in for the real challenger, Maria Karina Machado, who Maduro kept off the ballot. She's attracted crowds of tens of thousands across Venezuela, but there are real doubts that the vote will be fair or if Maduro will accept a result if it goes against against him. The U.S. and other democracies denounced Maduro's last election in 2018 as rigged. There's deep uncertainty about the outcome tonight, but a contested election could trigger mass protests and potentially another wave of emigration. A tense night ahead, Lindsay. We'll be monitoring that, Patrick. Thank you. Now to the second day of the Summer Games in Paris and Team USA boosting its medal count. Simone Biles makes a triumphant return battling through an apparent injury. And Team USA basketball played its first game dominating Team Serbia. Kevin Durant and LeBron James led the way. More now from the ABC's Baggy Ruley in Paris tonight. Tonight, an Olympic comeback for Simone Biles. 
powering through the most difficult vault ever landed by a woman in the Olympics despite a calf injury. A Yurchenko double pike, Biles launching off the vault, doing a backflip twice in the air with her hips bent and legs straight as if she's sitting on the floor. A move so rare, it's now called the Biles 2. The crowd roaring for Team USA and Biles' triumphant return to the mat after suffering a mental block in Tokyo known as the Twisties, prompting her to withdraw from the majority of the competition. Today, the 27-year-old soaring above the other gymnasts with the highest scores in vault and floor, heading into the individual all-around final, seated number one. Her coach joking afterward, not perfect, so she can improve even. Biles, the most decorated women's gymnast ever, injuring her calf before her floor routine, wrapping her ankle and seen limping, even crawling at times. Joining her in the all-around, teammate and defending gold medalist Sunisa Lee, making her own comeback after battling kidney disease, striving for individual gold on the uneven bars. And in the pool, another gold for Team USA. A 1-2 finish for the American women in the 100-meter butterfly. Tori Husk with gold, edging out teammate Gretchen Walsh with silver. We all can attest to how close that was and it was a great race and Lindsay for the first time in history we will have two former Olympic all-around gold medalists facing off for the title again and if either of these American women Simone Biles or Sunisa Lee win gold again it'll be the first time since the 1960s that a woman has won two Olympic all-around competitions Lindsay, somehow I'm feeling good about it, Maggie. Thank you. There's so much more ahead here on World News Tonight this Sunday. A new and simpler way to diagnose Alzheimer's could be on the horizon, much less invasive than current tests. And the nearly two-day nightmare on a Southern California highway pushes drivers to their limit. Next tonight, forecasters are watching a disturbance in the Atlantic that has the potential for development. Favorable conditions could help it form into a tropical depression in the coming days over the Leeward Islands or Greater Antilles in the southwestern Atlantic. Stay tuned. An end to what had been a nightmare for motorists in Southern California. The northbound lanes of the I-15 freeway between Barstow and Baker reopened early this morning. A section of road, a main route to Las Vegas, had been shut down for about 48 hours after a fiery crash involving a truck carrying lithium ion batteries. Motorists reported being stuck for hours. When we come back, orcas sink a yacht in the Mediterranean. To the index now, researchers in Sweden say early results are promising for new Alzheimer's blood test. The test, which is not FDA approved, measures proteins in spinal fluid. It would be less invasive for patients and could be administered by a primary care physician. Current tests are only performed at specialized centers. Doctors say more study is needed. Some terrifying moments on the high seas. A British boat captain says a pod of about five killer whales repeatedly attacked his yacht in a methodical way, he says, in an effort to sink the vessel. The incident lasted about two hours. He and his crew eventually abandoned ship, leaving the yacht to sink in the Mediterranean. Captain and crew were rescued by a passing ship. When we come back, the twins still going strong after 100 years. And what a celebration. Finally tonight, America Strong. The twin sisters celebrating a milestone filled with life, love, and family. Loris and Doris grew up doing everything together, and they still do. This month, they celebrated their 100th birthday. Happy 100th birthday! These twin sisters from Detroit got all gussied up in their identical t-shirts, which succinctly sum up their milestone with one word. Ooh. Fabulous. It's a blessing to, to be here at 100 years old. In 1924, the first Winter Olympics were held. Calvin Coolidge was president, and that same year, these now newly minted centenarians were born. Always together with everything. Thank everything. You. And the icing on top? A custom decorated birthday cake for these two sisters who say they're grateful for the gift of longevity, that being able to live in the present is the present. Good Lord bless us to see our family. It's just precious to live this long. Happy birthday. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Lindsay Davis. Have a great night.
Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.